Well, I'm certainly glad tonight that the Lord, an Lord answers prayer and has spared the life of Dr. Rodney Bell because I wouldn't have missed that sermon for anything in the world. I tell you, that's, that's my idea of preaching what we've heard tonight, and praise God for that. It's always a joy to be in a Sword of the Lord conference. I have been being in these conferences since back in the 40s. I don't remember the date. When you get my age, you forget things. And uh, I've been in scores of them since that time. The first time I was preaching in a Sword of the Lord conference back in the 40s was with Dr. Rice and some other people down in Lake Louise, uh, Georgia, at the Core Falls, I believe it was. And someone in that conference made the mistake, or did the right thing, I guess I should say. They said something about Billy Graham. And Dr. Letourneau put us all out so we could never go back again. I never will forget Dr. Bill Rice said, we're not going back till Dr. Letourneau apologizes for what he said. Somebody said, what did he say? He said, he said, get out. That's what he said. And so we got out. But there have been a lot of other places, and we thank the Lord for what the Lord has done through these conferences. As I said this morning, this institution means so much to me. It's had a tremendous influence on my life. I came here as a new convert out of the country of North Alabama, not knowing anything about the Bible or Christianity, not knowing what it meant to take a stand, and I learned that all here. And it's here I met my wife. We've been married nearly 51 years, and I thank God for this great institution. It's a great joy to be here in this conference. I, it's a little later than usual, and I don't want to belabor you too much. So I'd like to turn immediately to the scriptures, bring you the message I believe God has laid upon my heart for tonight. In Genesis chapter 18, I want to read uh, 22 verses to you tonight. And I believe if God will answer my prayer, that um, God will put something on our hearts tonight that will help us in this scripture. Let's read together in Genesis chapter 18. And the Lord appeared unto him, this is Abraham. The Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, bowed himself toward the ground, and said, my Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that you shall pass on. For therefore are you come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, and knead it, and make cakes upon the heart. And Abraham ran unto the herd, and fetched a calf tender and good, gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he dressed, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And here's the beginning of seven great questions asked in this chapter. You might want to look them up sometimes. Seven great questions. Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, 
After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. The men rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which is spoken of him. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they've done all together according to the cry of it which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And the men turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Now I want to call to your attention tonight a tremendous challenging verse in verse 14 uh, in the form of a question. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I read in these early chapters of the book of Genesis where the Lord appeared to Abraham three times. This, this is what we call the theophanies, the appearance of God. To people in the Old Testament times, the appearance of God sometimes in human form. Abraham had God appear to him three times. God spoke to him many times. But God appeared to Abraham three times. He appeared to him in Genesis chapter 12. When Abraham had come out of Ur the Chaldees, God had led him into the land of Canaan. And the Bible says, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham, and said, I, Unto thy seed I will give this land. I like to think that here God is appearing to Abraham to reveal his power unto him. The Bible says the Canaanite was still in the land. Seven nations. Here is a family. Here is a man with his family. A stranger and a foreigner. Yet God said unto him, I will give thee this land. It matters not if there are seven nations in Canaan more powerful than you. God said unto thy seed, I will give this land. God appears unto Abraham to reveal unto him his power. I read again that the Lord appeared unto Abraham in chapter 17. After Abraham had sinned against God, had made a tremendous mistake, after Abraham had resorted to the flesh to bring about the things of God, God had said to Abraham, Unto you and to Sarah shall be born a miraculous son in your old age. But one day... Sarah said to Abraham, Take unto you Hagar, this Egyptian handmaid, and bring to pass the promises of God. Of course you know that's not of God. God never performs his work in human energy and with human plans. And God appeared unto Abraham after that, and the Bible says, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk thou before me and be thou perfect. I like to think that here God appeared unto Abraham to reveal to him his sufficiency. First his power, now his sufficiency. God is saying to Abraham, I am all that you need. I am the God El Shaddai 
who is the all-sufficient God. Then God appeared unto Abraham in the chapter from which I have read. Abraham had the Lord appear to him in this chapter. I think for God to show Abraham that he was his friend. Abraham received the promise when he was 75 that God would work a miracle in his life. That miracle had not come. And the Lord appears unto him in chapter 18 and says to him, You are going to see the promises of God come to pass in your life. And Sarah laughed. Now, I don't blame her. When you stop to think Sarah was 90 years of age, her husband being 100 years of age, she laughed and these men said, Where did, wherefore did Sarah laugh? Ninety years of age being told she's going to have a baby. But these men, this appearance of God, these men said, Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I believe tonight that what God is wanting to do is to help us to believe tonight there is nothing too hard for God. We're living in a day when people are not only indifferent and cold, but people are despondent. Many of God's people are discouraged. They're uninspired. They're stagnant. Many churches and believers are on a maintenance program. Many are living in the past. But I want to say to you tonight, God asks us this question. Is there anything too hard for God? And I've been, I'm believing tonight that there are people in this audience who came to this conference. And maybe down in your heart you're praying, Oh Lord, may something be settled in my life while I'm here. I say to you tonight, is there anything too hard for God? There is nothing that God cannot do. You know, I believe, first of all, there's no promise in the Bible that God cannot fulfill. God fulfilled his promise to Abraham. God kept his word. Someone has said there are 30,000 promises in the Bible. And oh, how the promises of God in this wonderful book have sustained my life for nearly 54 years, living upon the promises of God. I was thinking tonight, when I was saved in 1935, August the 12th, 1935 in a little Methodist church down in North Alabama. When I was saved, I knew nothing about the Bible, knew nothing about the promises. But my mother gave me a little Bible when I left to go to Bob Jones College. My mother said, Tom, in this Bible, there are the promises of God that will see you through. I discovered in, in the Bible as a new convert Philippians 4.19 My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I claimed that promise. I didn't know about the context. I didn't know about all the things it taught in Philippians chapter 4. But I just knew that the Bible says My God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I claim that verse, and God has never failed to keep that promise in my life. Now, God has not supplied all my wants because my want, my wanter is not as sanctified as my neither. And God knows the difference. But God never goes back on a promise. Thank God tonight the promises of God in him are yea and amen. And God never goes back on a promise in his word. Why, even Balaam, the backsliding prophet, said, God is not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he not said, and shall he not do it? Hath he not spoken, and shall he not make it good? You see, God cannot go back on his blessed word. A young man Graduated from our school, I think in the first graduating class years ago. 
And um, 20, I think 28 years ago, he went to a town where they said the most elite and well-to-do people in Michigan live. It is said now to be the richest county in the world uh, up in Michigan. And this young man went there to start a church. He was just out of college and there was a church building for sale. And he wanted to buy that building. Of course, he needed funds. It needed a large amount of money. He's reading the Bible. And he came to Joshua chapter 1 and verse 3, where God said to Joshua, Wherever the sole of your foot shall touch, I'll give it to thee. Wherever your sole of your foot shall touch, that land I will give to you. Now this young man was not smart like you and I are. He didn't know all about the dispensations. You see, he hadn't dispensationalized himself right out of some of the promises. He didn't know any better, pitiful young man. So one night about two o'clock, reading the Bible, claiming the promises of God, believing that God could do anything, he pulled off his shoes, rolled up his trouser legs, went out and stepped off around that church building and around that property. And that night out in the moonlight, he said, Oh God, you've said that you, wherever my foot shall touch, you will give it to me. And I'm claiming this for God. Now mark you, he didn't think anything about it being in the Old Testament. He, he didn't think anything about it being in another dispensation. Poor guy, he didn't know any better. But to make a long story short, for 28 years, he'd been preaching in that building and other buildings having been added and many souls have been saved and people gone into the work of God from his work because he believed there's nothing too hard for God to do. Oh, tonight, if God could put it in the hearts of you and I, that God can do anything that needs to be done. There's no promise too hard for God to fulfill. I don't think there's any prayer too hard for God to answer. And I, I know tonight, by my own heart, that there's not a person in this building, I don't care how many prayers you've had answered, there's not a person in this building tonight but what is saying, oh, if God would do so and so for me. If God would just answer this prayer. If the Lord would just hear me about this. I want to tell you, friend, there is no prayer too hard for God to answer. I'm intrigued by Jeremiah 33 and 3. Call upon me and I will answer thee and show thee great and mighty things. Now watch this. Which thou knowest not of. I believe God wants to lead us in this matter of prayer, in areas where we've never been before, claiming the promises of God and seeing things come to pass. Not too long ago, a few months ago, my wife and I, who's here tonight, my wife and I were claiming a promise from God about prayer. If any two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, it shall be done. We were claiming that promise. We said to each other over a period of days, now God can do anything. But we also said, there's no one in the world could do this but God. There's no problem between the two of us. We were praying as prayer partners. And I believe that's what a, a man and wife ought to be, uh, among other things, is partners in prayer to God. We were praying, and we said one to another, you know, if we had all the lawyers in the world, they couldn't do anything about this. If we had all of our friends pool all their resources and all their power, they could do nothing about this. There's only one who could ever bring this to pass, and that's God. And one night, one afternoon about five o'clock, I was coming home from being out of town and Every day, every hour, we were claiming an answer to the promise. 
when I came to the door of my home and my wife opened the door, I'd been away for two or three days. She stood in the kitchen of our home with her hands raised and the tears streaming down her face. And she said, today God answered the prayer we've been praying about. And I want to say to you tonight, there is no prayer that God will not answer when a Christian meets God's condition. God said, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But I say unto you tonight, this Bible teaches, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it shall be done. You know, there are two kinds of, of people, I think, when it comes to prayer. Some are like the young, uh, like the, the leper who said, if thou wilt, thou can make me clean. If you will, I know you can. I know you're able. If you will, you can do it. But a man with a lunatic son in Mark chapter 9 said, If thou canst do anything, have mercy on us. One said it's a question of your will. I know you can do it. The other one said it's a question of your power. Can you do it? Hallelujah tonight. God can do it. And God can answer prayer. Sometimes people laugh at what I'm about to tell you, but you know my wife and I have lived in the same home for 40 years. I've been in the same church 47 years. I've been saved 53 years. And I get a hold of something good. I like to just hang on to it. I don't want to turn loose. But uh, about uh, 24 years ago, my wife and I, you're going to be thrilled about this now. I know you are. My wife and I bought a refrigerator and stove that was a mat uh, matching set. It's a beautiful pink enamel refrigerator and stove. My, we just liked that refrigerator and stove. And we had it for about 10 years. And one day the refrigerator started acting up and working intermittently and not performing as it should. So I called the technician in to fix the refrigerator. He came in with his tools, and he tested this and tested that, and very emphatically said, there's no hope for this refrigerator. Uh, it cannot be fixed. Uh, you might as well make your plans, buy another one. Folded up his toolbox and walked out, and I said to Mrs. Malone, he wasn't even nice about it. He gave us bad news and mad when he gave it. And um, I knew what was going to happen. I knew if I had to buy a refrigerator, I was going to have to buy a stove. I know my wife that well. So one day, now you wouldn't do this, and I know that you wouldn't. I, I'm, I'm sincere. I know you wouldn't do this. But one day, no one was around. I was in the kitchen, and there was that beautiful refrigerator not working, and the stove. And I just put my arm around it, I've been hearing about all these people who could put their hands on people and uh, prayer would be answered and people would be healed. And I, I know you wouldn't do this, but I just put my arm around the side of that refrigerator and I said, Lord, would you heal this refrigerator? I, I don't want... Now listen, I know it sounds crazy, but I was praying. I said, Lord, will you do something with this thing that even a technician couldn't do. My wife is here tonight, and I bear her, uh, I beg her to bear witness to the fact that for another 10 years, it never missed a beat. All oh, that these people that talk about touching bodies and healing them, let them heal a refrigerator, and then I'll listen to them. No, what I'm saying to you tonight, God is interested in your prayers. God is interested in the desires of your heart. And there's no prayer that God cannot answer. And oh, I would just beg you tonight, hold on to God. Keep on praying. Keep on believing. And God will bring the answer. Father, God can do anything. And there's no prayer 
too hard for God to answer. You know, I believe tonight there's no problem too hard for God to solve. And I'm talking to some people tonight I know that have problems. Everybody does. But I say unto you, according to the Bible, there's no problem God cannot solve. There are Christians tonight who are stopped and stagnated and arrested in their spiritual growth because of some problem that can be solved by the power of God. I like to read about when the children of Israel came to the waters of Marah, a bitter experience. And they said, the water is bitter, and the Lord's brought us here to drink these bitter waters. Maybe someone tonight is saying, the Lord has allowed me to drink bitter waters. But the Bible tells us that God showed Moses a tree, not just any tree, but a tree. And he put it in the waters, and the waters were healed, and the problem was solved. And I say unto you tonight, there is no problem God cannot solve in the life of a Christian. A lot of the Lord's people, you know, are so down in the mouth, it's so hard to, it's hard to get them to believe that. I heard a fellow one night, one of these down in the mouth Christians, nothing good ever happened, no praise in his life, no thanksgiving. I heard of, of one of these fellows that one night out in a storm on the road had a flat tire. He sat in the car and pouted and he said, no use to get out and try to flag anybody down. Nobody's going to stop on a rainy night like this. And he said, there's no use to go to somebody's house because they wouldn't let me in in a storm like this. And he said, if, if somebody did let me in, they wouldn't have a jack that would fit my car. So he sat there a while and finally got out, walked in the rain and came to the first house and walked up and knocked on the door. And the man came to the door and this down in the mouth Christian said, I don't want your old jack. I wouldn't have it if you gave it to me. Turned around and walked off the porch. And I want to say to you tonight, there's a many a Christian in a many a church who is defeated tonight by a problem that God is able to solve. God can solve, God can do anything. And God can solve any problem in the life of a Christian. I believe tonight there is no place too hard for God to revive. I'm glad for what Dr. Bob Jr. said last night about revival. Because some people, I'm afraid, don't know what revival is. I know revival is not just soul winning. I believe that's a part of it. But I'm saying to you tonight, I believe that God can bring a revival anywhere that God's people meet the conditions. The greatest need tonight in our churches and in our nation is a revival. It's not better equipment and more knowledge and more talent, more ability. We need a revival. And God knows what a revival is. And God knows how to send a revival. Some years ago, a friend of mine, well, it's Dr. B.R. Lakin, a good, quite a few years ago, one day just out of the blue called me on the phone. We talked frequently, but he just called me and he said to me, Tom, if you're asked to go to a certain town and he named the town and the church to hold a revival, he said, don't go. I said, all right. And we talked and hung up and I forgot about it. But one day the phone rang. The preacher from this town was on the other end of the phone. And he told me who he was. And I said to myself, now Lord, don't let him say what I think he's about to say. But he said it anyway. He said, Brother Tom, I want you to come to our church. We need a revival. I want you to come and preach here. No way I could say no. I said, all right, I will. I remember the Monday evening when I drove down into Ohio, got to a little motel at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. And this preacher met me and helped me 
get my things out of the car into a little motel room. There was the little table in the room and two straight back chairs. This has probably been 30, 35 years ago. He said, uh, Brother Tom, I want a revival. I want it worse than I've ever wanted anything in my life. They made me believe it. He said to me, Brother Tom, I would give my life to have a revival. He said, I'm willing if God will send a revival. I am willing to do anything. He said, could we pray? He got down on one chair and I got down with the other. And when that man arose, arose from praying, there was literally a puddle of tears on the tile floor of that little motel room. He said, I'll be back after a while to take you to, to the service. He came about seven o'clock and he said, Brother Tom, could we pray? He got down in one chair, I got down by the other. And that preacher said, Lord, we need a revival. Our church is dead. Our hearts are cold. There's nothing happening. We need a revival. Oh God, will you send a revival? And he said to God, Lord, I'll do anything. He said, Lord, search my heart. I want a revival in my own heart. And when he got up, there was a puddle of tears by the chair. He made a believer out of me. Yeah, he said to me after service that night, I'll meet you in the morning at 9 o'clock. 9 o'clock next morning, came in the same room, knelt at the same chair. I knelt at the other one. Preacher prayed, Oh God, what we need in our church is a revival. Hearts are cold. We need a warming. We need to see people saved. Our altars are barren. We need a revival. And he said to God, I'll do anything for a revival. He said, Lord, you know my heart. I can't lie to you. I'd give my life for a revival. Then we, that, after that prayer meeting, that morning, 9 o'clock, we got in the car, we drove the roads and the streets. No lunch period. 5 o'clock in the afternoon, calling all day, five o'clock in the afternoon, came back, got down with his chair, and he, he prayed the same prayer. Lord, I want a revival. I'll give anything for revival. And after he prayed, there was the puddle of tears, the weeping, the calling on God. The next morning, nine o'clock, same prayer, going out all day, five o'clock, praying again. Right through the week, a little sprinkling of blessing began to come. The few people were saved. Then about Friday night, a young man who later graduated from Midwestern Baptist College, 18 years of age, holding his Bible, came up to me in that church and he said, Brother Tom, my dad is a drunkard. My dad is lost. And he said he's 54 years old. And he said, if God would save my daddy, he said, it would be the greatest week, uh, to me, the greatest week of meetings I've ever known. He said, would you pray for God to save my daddy? Sunday came, the church seated about 400 people, not a large church. Sunday came and they put all the adults together at 10 o'clock and um, have one service just for adults at 10 o'clock. And I noticed down here, two seats were not filled. And a young man sat there. Now and then he glanced back. Now and then he looked back. And after a while, ushers came and seated a man and woman in the second row. When the invitation was given that morning, well, first of all, the preacher said to me now, Brother Tom, at 11 o'clock, we go on the radio. We got to wind up all this, get this service over by 11 o'clock because we go on the radio at 11 o'clock. When we gave the invitation that day, that Sunday morning, I saw a young man do something I've never seen another Christian do. I saw him go back and put his arm around his father's shoulders and beg his father to come. I couldn't hear them, but I knew what was happening. I've seen that hundreds, maybe thousands of times. But I saw him then get down on his knees in the aisle 
I saw him reach out and put his arms around his father's limbs, look up in his father's face, and beg his father to trust Christ and to be saved. All of a sudden, that father reached down and got his son under, under his arms and lifted him up. And they came weeping and staggering together to the altar. And when that happened, 62 adult men and women got up out of their seats who were lost and without God and without hope. They came and filled that altar two and three deep across the front of that church. When 11 o'clock came, that pastor came by the microphone and said, we're too busy to come on the radio. We have a lot to do here. And 60, 63 people, adults in all, in one service were saved. Now that, that doesn't mean revival. But I want to tell you, revival came to the hearts of God's people so that could happen. And I'm saying to you tonight, there's a many a Christian who no longer believes that God could give a revival. Now, God may not give a national revival, but I want to tell you, God can give a revival to your heart and your life. God can do in my heart and my life what God did in that preacher's heart. When he said, Lord, I want a revival, I'll do anything in order to have a revival. And I believe that's what we need tonight. We need a revival. You know, we're thinking about problems. We're thinking about difficulties. We're thinking about disappointments. We think about things that stagger us. But I want to say to you, God is able. He can do anything. And God can bring a revival. What we need tonight is to meet God's conditions in prayer and surrender and heart searching till we can say there's nothing between my soul and the Savior. There's no, no heart God cannot revive. I believe tonight that no person God cannot save. I know I'm talking to people tonight who have loved ones and friends and people that are lost for whom you pray God can save them. I believe that tonight with all my heart God can save anybody. A Savior that could save the woman at the well and a thief on the cross and a young rabbi who hated God and hated the church who could save those kind of people can save anyone. I walked into a little restaurant about three years ago where I did not usually go up in our, up in our city. And I heard profanity. And uh, nearly every in, one in there was cursing and swearing. And I was absolutely appalled at the atmosphere. I recognize the fact that the kind of the cheerleader for the whole bit of profanity was a man in this little restaurant standing back over a stove and he was cooking. I later found out he's an ex-Marine. He been, had been given a Distinguished Service Medal for his bravery and his courage uh, in the service and at war. And he was kind of the cheerleader for all his profanity. I sat at the table alone and I said to myself, Either, either this has got to stop, or I'll never be in this place again. But I got that man on my heart. And I said to someone before I left there, what's the cook's name? His name, like the movie actor, his name is Gene Kelly. said, uh, that man's name is Gene Kelly. I went to, we have a prayer meeting in our church, men's prayer meeting, every Sunday night at 5 o'clock. Uh, men meet and pray uh, in an upper room for an hour. Now, it's not the only prayer meeting we have, but we pray at that time. The men do. I said to the men, I have a man on my heart that I want to be saved. He is profane. He's violent. He blasphemes the name of God. I'm giving you his name. I believe he can only be saved, first of all, if God's people hold him up to the Lord in prayer and pray for him. Those men began to pray. I, it took me a long time before I could even get close enough to, my, to Gene Kelly to talk to him, to bear witness to him. But I did, but he did not get saved. There's a man in this church, in this service tonight 
that knows whereof I speak. Because one day the phone rang and I was out of town. And a man said, is Tom Malone there? And uh, the secretary said, no, he's out of the city preaching. He said, is there a preacher there? She said, yes, there are preachers here. And Dr. Fortner, who's in this service tonight, was contacted and told uh, about this man. This man said, I want to see a preacher. I want to talk to a preacher. And Dr. Fortner, who's sitting in this audience tonight, went and talked to Gene, to Gene Kelly. Gene Kelly told him, I just came from the doctor today, and the doctor says, I have just a few months to live. I want to be saved. And Dr. Fortner led Gene Kelly to the Lord. And I believe tonight with all my heart I've gone down the Romans' road with many a person. But I believe tonight Gene Kelly would be in hell tonight were not for the fact that the people of God took his name and bore his soul up to the throne of God and prayed, Oh God, save this man. And Gene Kelly was wonderfully saved and baptized. He took to his sick bed. I went to see him, took him a big, large print Bible. And every time I'd go to see him, he'd been reading that Bible. He had it laying on his bed where he could reach down and have his hand on it all the time. One day I went to see him and there was company. And he said to me, uh, I want you to come back another day. Just you and I, I want to talk to you. I went back another day when we could be alone. And Gene Kelly said, I want to tell you how to preach my funeral. Has anybody ever told you before how to preach the funeral? I said, I don't think so. He said, I want to tell you how to preach it. I wondered what was coming. He said, in that funeral, I'll have members of my family and a lot of friends who were lost just like I was. And I don't want to, you to give him a eulogy. He said, nothing about service record. I want you to tell those people but Gene Kelly was on his way to hell. But in answer to prayer and the witness of the people of God, I've been saved. And I want you to tell them, Gene Kelly is in heaven because somebody cared and somebody witnessed. I want to say to you tonight, I believe God can save anybody. I don't believe the hardness of heart is so much in the sinner. But the hardness of heart is in the Christian who will not weep and pray and live and witness and hold him up to God until the Lord saves him. Oh, tonight, God can do anything, anything. I ask myself tonight the question, what do I need to have God do for me? Whatever it is, God can do it. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Our Father in heaven, how we thank you tonight for your blessed word, which you never go back on. You always keep. Lord, I pray tonight as thou dost, thou dost look at, upon our hearts and thou dost see the need in the hearts and lives of the people of God. Some need to believe a promise. Some need an answer to prayer. Some need to believe that they can be revived and restored and empowered to do the work of God. Some tonight need to believe that you can save their loved ones and their friends. Oh, Spirit of God, tonight speak to hearts and may we leave here believing there's nothing God cannot do, that you can do anything. And Lord, tonight help us as Christians to take the place before Thee as Abraham stood before the Lord, believing You were able to deliver and You could do anything. God, tonight give us that conviction and that faith. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you keep...